Hi, I'm Andy. This is Rob, and we're here right now with Luke Meddings. Um, Hello. Luke, you are a, a dogma practitioner. Mm -hmm. Can you can you tell us, first of all, a little bit about what dogma is? Yep. Define it, please. Okay. Well, dogma is a way of teaching that's based very much on the people in the room. That's okay. one of the key principles. So the focus is not on published materials. Um, the focus is not too much on technology, right. but more on the face-to-face -face interaction, sometimes supported by technology, sometimes prompted by stimulus of one kind or another. How is that different than a um, student-centered approach? It's a very student-centered okay. approach. I mean, in a sense, it's a kind of student-centered approach with almost cut down with other processes removed. I mean, the, the, the big principle is conversation. Okay. Um, and so the challenge for the teacher is managing conversation, keeping it going, returning to bits of the conversation, you know, the sort of thing that lots and lots of good and experienced teachers do all the time. Um, but I think where it differs from some student-centered approaches, where it differs certainly from task-based learning, for example, is that we, there's very little setup. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very much about going into the room with an open mind, you know, a blank screen almost, and then seeing what emerges and working with that, working with the subject matter that comes out of the learners' lives and working on the language that they use to express it. Um, okay. Where, where did this come from? Was it sort of disillusionment with, with what was happening in the classrooms you were, you were watching? It or? came from lots of different places. I mean, w when I first got in contact with Scott um, in... Scott. Scott Thornbury in 2000, it was when he'd written a, an article, which is a reasonably well-known article, uh, called A Dogma for ELT. Mm -hmm. And at the time, he was teacher training in Barcelona, and I was teaching in London. And there were other people who immediately got in touch. But it was my experience of trying to teach in a way that reflected this very quickly changing demographic in our classes, not knowing who would be there from one day to the next, having multinational classes. Some people come in for half an hour, some for two hours. And so actually trying to plan everything, trying to control what was happening, was completely counterintuitive and didn't work. Um, and I, I'd also, for, from all sorts of different places, I, I just got more and more interested in materials light teaching, uh, truly communicative teaching. And then Scott was experiencing the same kind of doubts and the same sort of, making the same sort of discoveries via teacher training at that time in Barcelona. Can, can you describe uh, a I don't know if there's a typical, but a typical dogma lesson. What would it yeah. look like from start to finish? Well, one way of used to try and describe it, it would, it would look a bit like this. So we would start by talking. Um, if, there are, if there's something happening and people want to talk about it, then let them talk. Um, if you've got something in mind that you think might be a great way to start a conversation, then get started that way. One of the key things is to make notes. Okay. Yeah, so the teacher's making notes, maybe the learners are making notes themselves as they get used to this approach. And then instead of being a, a series of timed phases, as one would teach using a lesson plan, it's a kind of cyclical process. So it's, it's talk, and then it's pause and reflect. You know, what have we learned here? What kind of language has come out? Maybe we can come back to it later. Maybe we should look at it now. If we're going to keep talking about last weekend and the past tenses are all in a jumble, Maybe we should take five minutes and just do a quick revise on past simple. Okay. Um, and then we'll come back to the conversation. Okay. So, so it's, it's cyclical rather than phased, I would say. All right. Um, okay, so you're using a lot of emergent language. Yep. You're reviewing, revising. It's a, it's a little bit of a dance, isn't it? Yeah. Um, do you think you have to be an experienced teacher to be able to use this? Well, I, th I think there are two very interesting people here. Um, one of them, Anthony Gorn, is speaking at our symposium on Monday. And another, Dale Coulter, is giving a presentation this afternoon. Um, and they're both interesting in the sense that they have gone back to basics in terms of Anthony's teacher training unplugged experiment in Hamburg, which isn't really an experiment at all. It's something he's done with his and his colleague Izzy's CELTA course. And they, they a fantastic presentation last year showing how they'd stripped back their CELTA course to reflect the kind of teaching they wanted their trainees to be able to do immediately afterwards. Um, so, you know, that's a way of addressing that question is to say, well, let's go back to pre-service training. Let's see how differently we can set up the paradigms.
for our early experience in the classroom. And it's then quite a diffi difficult situation too, because on a, a CELTA teacher training course, yeah. um, you have you have well, to be honest, boxes to tick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've yeah. got a syllabus that you've got to get through. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think sometimes with uh, with teaching dogma in lots of different contexts, sometimes it's a case of looking at the at the boxes that need to be ticked and thinking, well, you know, how are we covering this? So very often. Um, criteria for good teaching or for good teacher training mentions things like learner centeredness and relevance to the learners and I think if you upgrade those in your record of what's going on and you show that you're ticking those boxes and some of the others can kind of fall out of that and um, the other interesting person I was talking about was yeah. Dale Coulter who uh, a bit like Anthony actually I think picked up on the launch of Teaching Unplugged uh, which is the book I wrote with Scott uh, two years ago. And it was recommended to him on the last day of his CELTA course. Well, this is really exciting for us as, as, as the authors. Um, and he was directed towards this book, as in, you know, you might want to find out a bit about dogma, and there's now a book. So he investigated, was interested, and has taught that way ever since. So when somebody asked the same question you asked, Andy, at the end of a workshop in London, and he was there, he gave a much better answer than I could because he just <laughs> said, well, that's what I do. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and I've done it for two years. And if you, if, you know, if you start with a different set of expectations in the classroom, then that changes everything you do. As, as well as the teacher's expectations, have you found, yep. or have, have teachers following this approach found problems with learners' expectations too? Yeah. I, th I think that, again, if you, if you take on board what many learners have experienced, often for years and years quite repetitively, which is teaching which doesn't give them enough opportunity to speak. Mm -hmm. And they come into an environment where they are being given almost carte blanche to speak and where it becomes apparent that their contributions are absolutely central to the lessons and that the language that comes out of their contributions is what we're actually going to focus on. It, it, it makes the argument for itself. I think there are people who, who and, and obviously there are different learning cultures, and there are say, people yeah, will, yeah. And, I, and I, yeah. and I think something we've always said is that you apply dogma as far as you can in the context you're in, and that can apply to a place and cultural expectations of the learners, and it can apply to the content of the course. If you're teaching an exam, you have to teach people how to pass the exam. But there's room, there's space for other stuff as well. You, you mentioned in the beginning um, technology. Mm. What, what role does that play? I mean, if you're mm. in a situation where you're going in and using this emergent mm -hmm. language, how mm -hmm. do you incorporate technology? Well, what's interesting is that technology's changed, as we all know. Um, a little bit. A little bit, since, since Dogma started in 2000. And the technology that was in classrooms then was all top down. And it was, you know, it was big, clunky old cassette recorders. A lot of stuff was associated with the course book. And it just didn't feel like something that could really reflect the immediate concerns of the people in the room, if that's what we were exploring. However, you know, for the last five years, four years, you know, absolute kind of global tipping point recently with mobile technology and with Web 2.0, you suddenly do have access to technology which can pick up directly on what people are talking about, what's sparking conversation. You know, photos on the phone or something. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, exactly. I mean, you can, if, you, if you've got Wi-Fi, you can go online in a class, then you can pick up on a conversation thread and say, okay, let's, have a, let's see what Lady Gaga's up to now, whatever. Or you can use them outside the classroom as homework, you know, as Shelley Terrell's great presentation this morning showed, you know. Do you really feel like this is a new idea or that it's been around for a long time and that you and Scott have given it structure and the name and... Yeah, how do you feel about that? I'd like to think we've given a, a group of ideas, uh, structure and a name. I mean, the way I talk about it now when I, when I train around dogma is that it started as a critique. And to some extent it started with what appeared to be quite a narrow focus on materials overuse. Um, and to a lesser extent, technology in the classroom then. But I think it's evolved and it's evolved into a framework approach. And that was what we tried to structure in Teaching Unplugged. And there's a kind of three-point checklist, if you like, okay. for what those, what are? which is if your teaching is conversation-driven, okay. if your teaching is materials light, and if you're focused on emergent language, that's dogma. Um, and you know there are elements of all sorts of fascinating educational movements in there, but I think what we've done is kind of tailored it for ELT, um, and tailored in a way that is flexible.
I hope. Um, I think there's a, a, a dogma discussion group. Yes. Um, do you know what, is that a Yahoo group? It's a Yahoo group. If you Google dogma Yahoo groups, you'll get there Did it close? very quickly. I, I it was it, there was a thought that it might close on the yeah. 10th anniversary. <laughs> Uh, which was really last nice. spring, and then there were enough people who wanted to keep it going that it has kept going, and it's still active. And, and a lot of ELT lists aren't or, or are, are faintly active. Um, so I think it's um, you know I think Scott has always been amazed that the idea has kind of lasted this long, and I'm just very excited by the responses we get from people. Um, after training sessions. They're quite passionate responses and very often, to go back to your, your question Andy, about whether it's new or not, the response isn't, oh my goodness, what a great new idea. It's more, I'm so glad you, you've said it's all right to teach this way. You know, this is how I used to teach. Mm. Or, I teach like this and I just keep quiet about it. Mm. And it's given people a vocabulary for a way of teaching which has been there for years. Um, thanks for stopping by and having thank a chat with us. Thank um, you for having me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks for watching. Um, that's Luke Meddings, and we'll be back in a few minutes with... Peter Grundy. Peter Grundy, yeah, okay.